rate. Again, my name is Benji Cohen with Minnesota DNR. And today on the 99th episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series, I'm going to welcome our nine-game wildlife program project manager, Lori Nelman, talking about eagles in the Minnesota Eagle Cam. So with that, Lori, I know eagles have been a huge thing in Minnesota. We have a large population of them here, and I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about that. So you should take it away. Great. Thanks, Benji. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me here today. Um, I'm going to talk about Minnesotans, I think, their favorite subject, maybe next to hunting, bald eagles, and the eagle cam. Um, we are in peak season right now, so uh, this, is a, this is great timing. So this image here that you're seeing on the screen is the leg of a bald eagle, and that silver thing above the yellow is a band, and the inset picture is a photo of biologists putting a band on an eagle chick's leg, and that is meant for identification purposes, but we won't be able to identify that bird unless it unfortunately ends up either sick at the raptor center or somehow is found dead somewhere. So we just use those for future identification purposes. It's not, um, obviously we need to zoom in really closely with that camera to be able to read those numbers. Um, and fortunately with this bird we were. So today I'm going to talk about why and when we installed a camera on this nest, what we've learned, some statistics about the camera and watchers, but first I want to talk a little bit about wildlife cams and why they are beneficial. So recent research has shown, especially during the pandemic, but that's when the research came out, was connecting to nature and enjoying wildlife is, re is really important. Um, Wildlife webcams are safe for humans and they're safe for the wildlife. They inspire an emotional connection between viewers and wildlife, and they're good for your mental health by providing relaxation and close, closeness with nature, making natural experiences available to anyone of any age. And our camera is shown in classrooms um, all over the world, as you'll find out. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I wanted to give you an example of how relaxing it can be to watch a wildlife cam. Um, I'll show you the eagle cam at the end. We're just going to watch the panda video today. And this is in um, China. And there's no pandas there. Oh, there they are. There they are. So I don't know about you, but I could watch this like all day, watching pandas play out in their yard. I just think it's fabulous. So you can see why people get completely addicted to these um, webcams, and that's not our point. We don't want people to get completely, but it, it, it is something that um, is just really relaxing. It helps you gain an emotional connection to that wildlife. And if you can't get out in nature, especially during the pandemic or for any other reason, it's an easy way for you to just disconnect and connect with nature, which is so important for our mental health. So the non-game wildlife eagle cam has been active since 2003. The camera was installed on December 28, 2012. Um, XL Energy was very generous in providing a bucket truck for us to install the camera up above the nest. The nest is 100 feet in the air. So we had to get a bucket truck. That was the only way that we could get up that high to be able to install the camera. Uh, MINUTE, which is our information technology, Minnesota information technology staff are at absolutely imperable for the camera operation and the performance of this entire operation. It's, um, it's very complicated and without the full-time staff of, you know, of 
the minute staff, we, we could not do this. They are on call almost all the time and they do a fabulous job. And the newest camera that we have, which is actually the third camera that we in, have installed at this nest because the first two ran into technical difficulties, now has sound and infrared. And so we can actually watch at night. And that's what that inset picture is, a pic, uh, an image clipped from the two adults that are currently on the nest um, fixing the nest at night. And what you see above that, if you look closely enough at that egg and the hole in the egg, you can see a tiny little beak poking out of that. And we're hoping really soon we will see a couple of eggs in our nest. Um, but you can see the chick actually emerging from the egg there. So did you know eagles can fly up to 30 miles an hour and dive up to 100 miles an hour? They can live more than 30 years in the wild and males are one third smaller than the female. They, can, they do mate for life um, and they use the same territory for life, but life can be short in the wild. And so they will ad, ad, allow a different um, mate into their territory and um, their whole entire existence is on reproduction. And so they will do what they have to do to continue their cycle, their reproduction and, and to raise young. Their grip and their talons is 10 times stronger than humans. And that allows them to pick up fish, wet fish in the water. That and their talons, their, their huge long claws on the end of their talons is what helps them to be great fish eagles. Their eyesight is eight times stronger than humans. They have a seven, six and a half to seven foot wingspan. Their eyesight, in addition, I wanted to mention, not only is it eight times stronger, but they also have more of a view of around their head. Their, their eyeballs take up almost the entire part of their skull, which means most of their brain is eyeball, and that allows them to have really, really powerful vision, and it's way more powerful than yours or mine. So this is just some interesting history um, about the eagle cam. I'm sorry that bottom slide got um, cut off a little bit, or that bottom row got cut off a little bit there. But this is just some um, quick facts about how many eggs were laid and what dates they were laid each of the years that we've had the camera on, and then how many birds actually fledged. And fledged means flown from the nest, successfully raised to the size that they can fly out of the nest successfully and, and make it on their own as, as they grow to be adults. So we've had a total of 25 eggs laid at this nest in the last 10 years, and a total of 15 chicks have fledged. Um, the nest can be disturbing to watch at the time, you can, uh, at, at times, and you can kind of see that some of the notes there say, you know, fail to hatch. Um, one of the one of the chicks was euthanized, meaning it, it had to be put down because it had aspergillosis, which is a, a fungal infection and a broken wing. And um, and chicks die on the nest occasionally, but this is nature; it's not Disney. And so, uh, watch with caution. Um, it's definitely worth it, but it, from time to time, you may need to walk away, and that's okay. That's the best part about watching a webcam: you can stop, you can walk away, you can turn it off. So our web camera, um, I got some web stats from our, our wonderful M Minute staff. So this, this is some kind of technical stuff, but our top 10 users watching the Eagle Cam are from these countries. Of course, the United States is number one, um, then Canada, the United Kingdom, but all the way down, uh, down to Italy. Um, we've had a total of 1.8 new use 1.8 million new users um, come in and watch the camera and that also translates and you know new user you, regular users is 1.9 million new year users is 1.8 million and that's a total of 11 million sessions and there's also stats about how long of a period of time people spend watching the eagle cam but it's usually quite a bit of time it's much longer than most other um, 
videos or anything else that people watch because we live in an age of TikTok, right? So um, it, you know, people are easily distracted, but this is a way to slow down um, and just, just watch the cam for a while. Um, and so this is, this is a worldview of how many countries watch and have watched and visited the Eagle Cam. And everything that you see in white, only the ones you see in white, are the countries that have not visited the Eagle Cam. So you can see it's, it's a worldwide, almost worldwide, probably everywhere that um, people have web access, have visited our Minnesota Eagle Cam, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see it in a map this way. So Minnesota has the highest eagle population in the lower 48 states. Um, and that's pretty, pretty cool considering they were endangered in, um, back in the 1960s. Um, they almost went extinct along with a lot of other really large birds because of a pesticide called DDT. Pesticide, um, DDT was thankfully banned in 1972, um, but eagles still face current threats. Um, lead poisoning, illegal shooting, and habitat loss are still great threats to the eagle population. So what can you do? What can you do as, as um, people who care about bald eagles in Minnesota? Um, well, one thing you can do is to um, donate to the non-game wildlife checkoff on your tax forms. You can also donate online. We have the ability to do that. Um, some people even send us in checks because um, they're donating from other parts of the world or donating from other parts of the country, or they just prefer not to donate online. So think about the non-game wildlife checkoff at tax time. It's the little, little line with balloon um, or the pop-up that reminds you to donate to the checkoff. We've done a lot of uh, research and surveys and we do lots of things to help bald eagles. Um, and we helped rebuild the population after we almost lost um, the entire population in the country. So watching bald eagles in Minnesota. So this is the next logical step. So if you get really you know, into watching the, the non-game eagle cam um, and you wanna see them in person, you can go out and do that. They're, they're really close by. Um, this map shows you know, the general area of where bald eagles are in Minnesota, but they really are everywhere now. Um, and their nests are just about everywhere. Um, winter is the best time to see bald eagles because there's no leaves on the trees. And so you can see them better. Um, you watch near lakes and rivers where they hunt um, because they're considered fish eagles, and, as I had mentioned, but they are, um, they are carnivores. So they eat it just about anything um, that, that, is, that is meat, um, when, you know, including birds and mammals and fish. So when you're out watching, look for open water near frozen areas um, of ice because they like to sit on the edge of the ice. Um, Minnesota State Parks and wildlife areas are great places to watch for bald eagles. Um, extreme Northern Minnesota and Southeastern Minnesota are probably the areas that you're guaranteed to see an eagle if you go out and watch, especially in January and February. And look for those big, huge nests in the air. Um, they can weigh up to uh, 2,000 pounds. So they're pretty easy to spot up in a tree. Some people have said it looks like the size of a Volkswagen, uh, a beetle. So some areas in Minnesota, and I know these maps aren't great, but you can see these on our website, mndnr.gov forward slash non-game, and then do a um, and forward slash non-game forward slash eagles. Um, and this is a map on the left of Wabasha, Minnesota, which is where many, many eagles congregate. And they are, there are pull-off areas um, at, at one, two, and three here that, that might be kind of hard to see. One, two, whoops. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I am sorry. Yep. No problem. You know, I just put the link in there for the National Eagle Center too, which is along Highway 61 and the map you were talking about. Yeah. Which is a, yeah, that... I was just down there 
last week in a coffee mill, and I think we saw four or five eagles just on our drive down to Wabasha from Red Wings. So, yeah, and they of. also they also keep a count. So they have um, of these particular areas, and I was just going to talk about that. They keep um, a tally, and you can go to their website and see Friday um, each Friday that they go out and do their counts. You can see how many eagles are actually gathered there. Right now, most eagles are pairing up. And they're and they're in nesting mode, so you're not going to see a whole ton right now, um, at least not down in that area, um, you know. But they will be doing their hunting and fishing because they need to feed their mate while their mate lays eggs and is incubating. Um, both both the male and the female take part in the incubation and feeding and raising of the young, so it could be either one that you see hunting and bringing food to the nest. But look for that big white head, neck and white tail in tall treetops. Look up, they're soaring in the sky. Binoculars are always a great option um, for seeing them up close. And, and maybe if you see a white spot, which of course, if there's snow on the trees, you're gonna see a white spot and think it might be an eagle. If you have binoculars or a scope, that's a great way to, uh, to see them. So um, the National Eagle Center, whoops. So uh, the National Eagle Center in Wabasha is, um, has great educational tools for um, for kids and you can go there and you can test your grip strength on a machine that shows you how strong you are compared to what a bald eagle is. Um, you can look through a scope and a viewing a viewfinder that shows you how well eagles can see compared to your own vision and it's just a really fun learning experience and they hold seminars all the time and they also hold, hold outdoor field trips for going out and watching bald eagles. Thanks so much. And now, questions. <laughs> Does anyone Great. have questions about bald eagles in general, biology, where to see them, anything? I know we were one of the first states with the eagle cams, but how many other states do you know of that have eagle cams now? I know Iowa does. So there are lots of bald eagle cams out there. They're not all run by state states, though. Um, and so we are one of the few, we are one of the few eight owned and operated Eagle Cam. Most of them are private. So, and, and there's a list of them. You can do a Google search um, to find you know, just bald Eagle Cams. And there's many, many of them out there. And so some of them have full-time staff to uh, operate and, and, you know, increase um, you know zoom in on the eagles and things like that we don't have full-time staff that can do that i do it as often as i can but it's uh it's it, it is it would be a full-time job to be able to to be able to operate the camera all the time yeah uh, one of the things i've seen too and we talked a little bit about this in our wildlife photography um, program we did here a few weeks ago but what do you do around eagles? So you, you see them along the roadside sometimes eating stuff or you're, you're out viewing them. What are some tips and tricks about how to act around them, distance to stay away from them? you have any tips around that? Well, it's best to stay as far away as you can, obviously. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, you don't want to disturb them, it, especially, you know, if they're eating or if they're if they're nesting, you know, keep keep your distance. Eagles have become very tolerant of humans, but you don't want to you don't want to you know encroach on them, especially um, when they're nesting or trying to feed their young things like that. Uh, not to mention it's illegal to harass wildlife, and so if you get too close to them and that causes them to flush from their nest, consider that harassing and back off. Um, that's why I suggest binoculars or a scope because you can see them then from enjoy them from a distance and that's the other benefit of having um, the webcam is you can see them then uh, without disturbing them so but if you see them on the road or certainly if they're injured um, call the raptor center or call someone um, um, call the the minnesota dnr or conservation officer um, to help with with that injury um, but don't don't try to stop on the road and save them yourself yeah, they're big and they have sharp beaks and claws. So not, not to mention, it's, it's never worth a human life. You don't want to, no. you know, risk anyone on the highway or something like that. If, um, you know, 
if your life might be in danger to do so. And certainly we care. Um, it's not um, something you want to do. So you brought up injured animals. I know we're getting to that time of year where other critters, all kinds of critters out in the woods are going to be having babies here in another month or two. We're actually doing, doing a webinar on how to, how to deal with that a little bit to intervening, intervening with wildlife. But I'm sure you get some calls from people watching the yield cam that, you know, like, oh, the chick's getting picked on or want you to intervene in some way. Um, what do you, how do you respond to that, I guess? Um, we normally let them handle their own life in their nest. Um, it's, it's, again, like I said, it's, this is this is not Disney, this is real life. And we did go to um, the nest and, and retrieve a chick once because the public had um, raised some huge concern and we got a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, and um, it became a really, really big thing. Um, it even made the New York Times how upset people were that we weren't saving this chick. So we did go into the nest and retrieve the chick. And that was the one that had aspergillosis and a broken wing. And so it ended up being euthanized. And now that chick, and this is where the brutal part comes in, that chick could have been important food for the other two chicks in the nest that might have been starving. And in fact, that's what happened the following year. Um, the youngest chick was getting picked on because there was food scarcity, which just means they weren't competition between the chicks for the food that was there. So they beat up on the younger one and it ended up not making it. And the mother fed that chick to the other two chicks. And that was really important protein. It was really important nourishment for those two younger chicks. So it's something that the public has become used to now that there have been wildlife cameras around for a while. And now that they've been watching the Eagle Cam for a long time, so they don't get quite as upset, they understand how important it is to let nature do its own thing because it does really does know best. That's a good point. Let nature be nature. So Maverick had a had a fun fact he put in here. Now, did you know that ball eagles can shoot their poop up to six feet? You must have visited. Oh yeah. Because I think they talk oh, yeah. about that. <laughs> you you could absolutely see that. And for whatever reason, the male that we have on the nest now likes to sit up on the branch and he just shoots poops right into the for well once the chicks have. <laughs> uh, Tim was asking, can you tell us more about what and how they hunt besides for fish? Oh yeah, so they, they're they really, really opportunistic. So they, they do eat a lot of roadkill. Um, so that's something that is easy for them. They'll a rabbit off the, on the side of the road, something like that, which is dangerous for them, but that's how they've adapted to human activity. Um, they also hunt for rabbits and squirrels, and it's that eyesight. It's those huge eyeballs that allow them to see if they're really focusing on something when you're watching the camera, they may be focusing on a squirrel or a rabbit. And then they just use that incredible speed to dive down and pick up something um, without, without the prey even knowing. Um, and so things that we've seen come into the nest are um, ducks, squirrels, rabbits, all kinds of different birds, pigeons, um, uh, let's see, no cats, no cats. That's an urban myth. <laughs> we have not seen any cats come into this nest. Um, uh, it just, you know, they'll eat just kill. Roadkill is something, there was a deer that was killed not too far from the nest last year. And um, the eagles were able to feed off of that for several days. Uh, Karen was asking uh, kind of two questions here. Do you have an estimate of how many pairs of eagles are nesting currently in the Twin Cities? She was thinking a few years ago it was over 30. In the Twin Cities? I would think it's over 30, um, you know, 30 to 40. We, I don't, I haven't, seen, I think that Unfortunately, the avian influenza did have a big effect on the bald eagle population last year. Um, and, and we did get lots of reports of dead eagles, unfortunately. And 
we count nests, not necessarily um, pairs or individual birds. And so it's hard to tell which birds have, some birds have alternate nests. So they build two in case something happens to one. So when you're counting nests, that doesn't necessarily translate into a pair. So the short answer is it's probably pretty close to about 30 in the metro area, but that depends on what you call the metro. You know, seven county metro, 10 county metro, 10 county metro, it's probably 200. I, 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 I'm not sure. So, but it's, it, we certainly have quite a few. There is a bunch of them. So I, I have, I think I told you the other day, there's two nest within three blocks of my house, I bet. So just kind of, yeah. kind of neat. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Kimberly was asking uh, two questions. And one of them, I don't think we can disclose the exactly where the Eagle Cam nest is located. It is close to the to the to the Twin Cities Metro. That's, that's it, it would count as a Metro say. County nest, yeah. Yes. She was wondering, do you know where A one is now? Not for A1. sure. What she's referring to as A one. Um, E one. Um, and so I it probably she's probably referring to E one, and that is what we referred to group um, referred to as the first chick from last year. Um, and it was the one that killed its sibling um, because there was a bit of competition for food because the male disappeared. So food was scarce. So she pushed her, her brother out of the nest and it ended up dying. Um, and we did bring that to the Raptor Center and, and he did not make it. Um, but no, we have no way of knowing. Once we banned those eagle eaglets and once they fledged from the nest, we have no way of knowing where they go. We don't have transmitters on them. We don't have geolocators on them or anything like that. So there's no way of knowing because there are so many bald eagles out there. When you talk about you know, bald eagle pairs, maybe 30 within the Metro, but bald eagles individually, there's probably a thousand, um, something like I, I'm, I'm. It, that's a wild guess, but that's including all of the chicks that have not um, matured yet to the white head and the white tail, and though you know that means they're all under five years old, and so there's lots and lots of them out there. We don't, we have no idea which one, you know, even if it has a band on the leg. There are lots of chicks that are banded in the metro area too. So unless it shows up sick or dead, which would be bad, uh, we won't know um, what happens to any of the chicks that we banned, unless they end up on a camera and we can zoom way in and look at that band. So you just brought up a great point too that a lot of people don't realize is as a chick, bald eagles don't they're not born with a white head. They grow into that. And can you talk about that a little bit and how to tell the difference between bald eagles and do we have any other eagle species in Minnesota? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Benji. So we do have um, golden eagles in Minnesota, um, mostly in the in the winter months. They come northern Canada to spend their their balmy winter in, in balmy Minnesota. Um, that's like warmth to them. They come down um, to spend their time in the southeast, which is where you're looking, you know, for bald eagles as well, down in the Wabasha area. And so we know that uh, golden eagles come down. They feed on um, wild turkeys and uh, fox squirrels down in that area. And they do have a golden eagle eagle count that is organized by the in the winter time as well. So if you get an opportunity to partake in that, that's also an awesome, awesome trip. But bald eagles are um, Bald eagle chicks, when they fledge from the nest, so that when they're um, three months old, they are as big as, if not bigger, than the adult parents. And the reason they look bigger is because their wings are a little bit longer, they're a little bit stronger, to help them before their first molt, to help them with learning how to fly. So, they're, so they look bigger, uh, but they're completely brown, and they stay completely brown. Um, for at least the first two years. Then they start getting some patches of white on them all over their body. Um, and then eventually when they're five years old, they get a white, hail, white head and a white tail. Now, a golden eagle is also completely brown. They have, um, however, sort of a golden tint to their head, much like the bald eagle, um, but it's, it's not nearly as bright. 
They are slightly larger than bald eagles, but it's really hard to tell the difference between an immature bald eagle and a golden eagle. So watching the skies, paying attention to their patterns and their habits is about the only way to tell the difference and usually their location as well. If you think that at location and time of year, if you think that you see a golden eagle in summer in Minnesota, it's probably an immature bald eagle. That's interesting. Uh, somebody was asking about windmills. Are windmills a significant hazard for eagles? They saw a post for someone to monitor eagle casualties around windmills. And we had a lot of, lot of windmills coming around southern Minnesota. Yeah, so um, wind farms are required to report any fatalities to us. Um, and before they even build their they have to um, do surveys and and uh, an environmental impact statement and make sure that they are not building close to bald eagle nest. Now that's not going to prevent the eagles from coming in and building near there. And so yes, they are a hazard. I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as significant, um, but it is another hazard. It's another you know in addition to like I said, um, lead and and illegal shooting and habitat loss. Um, you know, windmills are certainly a part of that. Great. Um, Mark was asking, if you find a feather or a dead eagle, what should you do? You should call the DNR. Um, you can call the 800 number or um, you can either bring it to the Raptor Center um, life office. Um, if However, we start to find avian influenza in bald eagles again, then it is best not to touch them and leave them. Um, keep an eye on the news and keep an eye on our website for any announcements regarding um, avian influenza because that is um, uh, certainly a possibility that that may pop up again and then we would advise um, not touching them and just leaving them on the landscape but calling us to report them and we will record um, we will record that and keep track of, of where they're where they're dying. So you just answered Elizabeth's question also. She was wondering if eagles are still getting sick from the bird flu, which sounds like it could be a possibility. So keep an eye on the news, huh? We, we, it has not been verified yet. It hasn't been found. Um, again, this, this fall or this winter, um, but the weather starts to change a little bit. It's a possibility, especially migration. Migration is what brought it in last year. Um, so it was it was mostly in ducks. It was mostly in the food that the eagles were eating. And so that's how they contracted it. And that's why they were such, uh, they were one of the, you know, eagles and um, ow owls who eat other birds that have migrated from the south. And that's how, how they were getting sick. So keep an eye um, on the news and, and on our website. Uh, Sally is wondering, Talking about territory, what is the range of their territory from their nest? Um, so it it's generally about a mile, um, but like I said, they can have an alternate nest, and so sometimes um, than that. Um, and and but but it's generally about a mile, and that's almost about as far as our eagle cam can see. And so sometimes um, if if we're zooming, zooming the camera around, we can see them perched in a tree way, way far away, and we can try to zoom in um, uh, on them. But they will usually choose an area that is um, they can they can see where they can see water, and they can see lots of landscapes, so they can do their hunting and and fishing well and, and with with their eyesight. Uh, Elizabeth has a behavior question: an eagle uh -huh. nestled into the nest yesterday as if there were eggs, but I couldn't see any eggs. What was up with that behavior? Is there eggs in the nest now? There are not eggs in the nest yet. We were hoping they would lay on Valentine's Day. They have in the past, but this this year they didn't. We're expecting an egg literally any minute. That what you're seeing is that behavior, um, she's practicing, she's she's nesting. Is And so she's, the nest is ready. It's got the soft materials in there. It's got the, um, grasses and leaves and all of that, which is soft landing spot for the eggs. And so um, so that it's not all just big, heavy sticks, right? So they put the soft stuff in there and then she starts to nestle down in there. That not only signals to the male that she's, 
but it also um, prepares the bowl to be the right shape for eggs when she when she lays them. Oh yeah, uh, Jody was asking about links for the location of the next webinar. I will put that in the chat here momentarily. Uh, Elizabeth made a comment, and I I think she's right on this, but it clarified for me. Um, she thinks it's illegal to have any part of an eagle in your possession. So if you do find like a feather, an eagle feather or something, you can't just pick that up and take it home and, and keep it, correct? Yeah, absolutely right. And that's not just eagles, it's any uh, migratory birds. It's not legal for you or I to just pick up and keep um, any part of any bird because they are protected. And then in addition, bald, bald and golden eagles are protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Act of 1940. And the reason for that is because people would actually kill birds and eagles to keep their feathers. Um, however, um, Native Americans can and do have permits to, um, to use them for ceremonial purposes, but they, they apply for that and they receive the feathers or bones or whatever part of the um, eagle that they are going to utilize. Um, and they get that from the repository in Colorado. So that's why it's best to report anything that you find um, either on the landscape or uh, that you witness dying or something like that to report it to DNR so it can. Um, Karen has a question here that we're, we're gonna ask, but I'm not, I kind of know the answer. Is there any current push in the legislature to outlaw lead shot in Minnesota to stop lead poisoning of eagles? And we've talked about that through the non-game thing. We've talked about it in hunting presentations we've done, and we've talked about fishing presentations, the issue of lead in in fishing tackle, in hunting ammunition is, is a concern. I'm not aware of anything in the legislation right now, are you? I, I am not. I, I don't think that there's anything but um, the legislature never ceases to uh, surprise me there as far as I know there is nothing right now I I know that the um, the DNR did did um, d decide last year that they were going to make some SNAs and um, and as I think it was state parks. Um, I believe so, yeah. But free for, for hunting. Um, and so they're still working on that language as far as I know. But that's that's all I know for now. Yep. And to be clear, we at the DNR too, we, in all our fishing programs and our hunting programs, we, we promote the use of, of lead-free tackle and ammunition all the time. So that's, yes, you know, Yes, and, uh, and it's just a great thing in general. It's a great alternative because eagles are attracted to those gut piles, and if you and if gut piles are left out in the wild, the eagle will eat them. And um, they're actually attracted to gun gunshot sounds in the fall when there's deer hunting going on. They know that there's going to be a gut pile left there for them. It's it's you know great food for them. But if there's any lead in there, it is likely to kill a bald eagle. It's not just it it could or it or it might it is likely parts per million to kill a, a bald eagle from lead poisoning elizabeth asked another question similar to this what is being done to protect eagles from the kind of hazards that occurred recently at a waste facility you know i heard um i heard i did hear about that and i am not I, I don't know. I am not privy to that happen. I do know that landfills are required to, um, you know, they they have a requirement to to make sure that their landfills are um, protected from vectors. Vectors meaning anything that would come in and eat any of the you know things in the in the landfill. But I don't know. I think that was a one-off incident, as far as I understand. Um, that 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 was just one particular incident that happened that it's not an ongoing problem, but I'm not privy, I, I don't know. I didn't hear any more about that. Okay. Uh, Sue had an interesting question. Can osprey and eagles coexist in the same territory? Yes, they absolutely can. Um, and in fact, they do. And they will they might take over each other's nests. It's because um, they're both big, huge, 
earlier than osprey, so sometimes they will take over their nest, but they absolutely do coexist. Um, I've never heard of them fighting or fighting over territory or anything like that. Um, ospreys are strictly fish eaters, so osprey will be near water and osprey only eat, eat fish. And so there's not gonna be that food competition for all of the other things that eagles eat, you know, like mammals or roadkill, things like that. Great. Uh, Kimberly had a question talking about maturing eagles. Do you think the male this year is old enough to fertilize the eggs and how do we know? Mm, that's a good question, we don't know. Um, he seems a little inexperienced to me, although I think he's been a really good part of helping build the nest. Um, but based on some other males that we've had who really kind of know what they're doing, he seems a little bit inexperienced because he, he hasn't been bringing in a ton of food for the female. He, um, we have not seen them mate yet, but that's not unusual. Um, sometimes they don't mate on their nest and they may be doing it somewhere else. But it remains to be seen. It seems like the female is, you know, she seems to be doing a lot of waiting around for him. <laughs> I'm not, so I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Sounds like a Dr. Phil question. <laughs> right? Rebecca, Rebecca was wondering, could you estimate the size of the nest? I'm assuming she's talking about the one in the eagle cam. Oh, good grief. It's going to fall out of that tree pretty soon. It is huge. Um, I was looking at pictures the other day comparing and I'm comparing the size of the nest when we first put the camera in to now because they add sticks every year and it gets built up. This year we had two feet of snow on top of that nest, two feet of snow on top of the nest. And then they built another nest on top of that because, because they needed something dry. And so it probably, it probably does weigh about 2000 pounds. It is um, at least eight feet across and six feet deep. It's huge. It's huge. It's gigantic. I mean, you don't really realize it until you see a human up there, you know, either installing a camera or when we and they reach into the nest um, to, to get the chick, you just have no idea. And when the chicks are getting ready to fledge, you also don't have any idea of the size of them. Um, they're huge. They're they're just they're huge. It's interesting. Oh, I just lost my. In fact, there. I could show you. Hang on. Okay, this is impromptu. There you go. But this is the size of. I, I know this isn't great, but this is the size of a bald eagle. This bald eagle. Uh, unfortunately, was electrocuted. There he is. <laughs> it was electrocuted uh, several years ago. And so we got a permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service to keep it and use it for educational purposes. Um, and it um, weighed about 10 pounds. And that's the size of those chicks when you see them before they fledge in, this, in July. That's how big they are. They don't look that big when you're watching them on camera. That's true. And you go down to the Eagle Center in Wabashaw too, and you can kind of get up close to some of the eagles they have there. And it's it's amazing how big they are. Yeah, they have some permanently injured live bald eagles that you could see there indoors. It's pretty cool. And Mark was wondering, this is a great question, how long from the time of mating until the eggs are laid, typically? Well, uh, mating starts pretty early. Um, and so, it doesn't necessarily depend on, on that. Um, they continue to mate even after the eggs are laid. Um, it's, that's more of a bonding practice for them. I mean, obviously it, it does the fertilization of the egg, but it's also a bonding practice for them. And so they will continue to mate until their hormones settle down once they're feeding those chicks constantly. So then both of their hormones settle down. And then if the egg is fertilized, the female's going to lay eggs, regardless of whether they're fertile. She's got to. She's been building up calcium in her body all year long. And so those eggs are going to come. They may not be fertile, um, but if they are, it'll be uh, 35 days from the time she lays her egg until uh, approximately 35 days until the eggs hatch. 
So that's when we start watching between 34 and 36 days. Great. Um, any concerns about the integrity of the nest and the tree? So they're pretty smart yes. builders. Yes, they are, but the tree is not gonna hold that nest forever. Um, and so that's why we actually, so that if something happens to this one, um, we have we have a backup one, um, and we're hoping to put it in a nearby nest, another metro nest. Um, but the tree is is only going to last so long. You know, it's a cottonwood. I I I don't know the exact lifespan of a cottonwood, how how long they last, but there are uh, several dead branches on that tree. So, we yes, we're concerned about it for sure, especially when it gets really windy out. Uh, Jody was asking. There's a Nest along Highway 10 about by Coon Rapids that looks rather small, at least from the road. What's the smallest eagle nest you've seen? Oh, well, if something happens to a nest and they, that female's ready to lay eggs, they can they can whip up a nest pretty quickly. The it generally says that it takes three months to build a nest because they prefer large nests, and so that's where I say that they might take over an osprey nest, but they'll only do that if they're if they're in desperate need of a nest. Um, when our original female was kicked out of her territory several, four years ago, we suspect that she went to a nearby abandoned nest and laid those eggs. Um, and so, you know, our nest was not that big when, when the camera was put in. I would say that it probably, you know, it was less than half the size that it is now. So hard to say what the actual smallest is, but they don't, they don't need much. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Laurie. It was really an interesting talk. I think we made it through all the questions there, unless somebody sees some in the okay. chat I missed. Um, we did get some cool poll results back. Um, awesome. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for answering those. Do you watch any wildlife cams on a regular basis? Um, a lot of people said yes. All the Minnesota DNR. A few people answer no, but I will now. I'm planning on it. So. Awesome. Uh, one of the other questions, have you ever ventured outside or gone on a trip to look for eagles. 89% uh, of the respondents had done that, which is kind of fun. That's one of our favorite pastimes and a not so fun day outside is to go for a drive and look for eagles, especially being originally from Red Wing. It's a good area to watch for them. So. Yeah. And we have about 65% of our respondents have donated to the non-game wildlife fund also. So thank you everybody for that. For that, yes. Mark. Mark put one more question in here. When gathering sticks, do they cut them off the tree with their beak or tear them off with talons or both? Uh, they they tear them off with their talons. They generally will go for they they know what a dead what a dead branch looks like. Either something that is already dead or about to be dead. And I've seen them actually, you know, pulling on a branch that that they think is dead and they're trying to pull it off the tree. So it's those strong, it's that strong grip of their talons that helps them to pull off the dead stuff. Um, or they find it find, you know, on the ground. Great. Well, again, Laurie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank thanks you everybody for joining us today. Uh, yes, next thanks, week, everyone. next week we have a great program on foundational fire building. So tune in, it will be our 100th episode, which is kind of a milestone for us. It's kind of fun. We're going to learn about building fires, how to how to get them going with uh, other alternatives than a big lighter. So join us next week and keep an eye on our website, minnesotadnr.gov slash discover. And we will have our spring registration up fairly soon and a whole bunch more programs you can join us on. So thank you, everybody. Uh, share with Thanks your friends everyone. and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Laurie.